So it's with great joy that we're going to open the Word of God together in the Second uh, Peter Second Epistle. So it's Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. This is the fir the third message in a uh, series on the sufficiency of scriptures. The question that we want to answer is it, it's the following question: Is the Bible sufficient in our Christian life? Has God already spoken in this book, and is and and if that were that's enough, uh, is there did He say enough uh, in the Bible, or do we need to find some other uh, communication medium like um, additional communication through emotions, through experiences, through thoughts, through dreams, through feelings, through whispers, like through uh, through other things, through voices, through coded messages? the messages that we are supposed to decrypt and discern God's will or is the Bible sufficient? The reformers 500 years ago faced the attack on the authority of the scriptures. It was the war against the uh, for the authority of the scriptures. And did God's authority re reside in councils and popes or in the Bible? Or is it the Bible that has the authority? And today, uh, the war we are facing is on the sufficiency of scriptures as well. Do we believe and live as if the scriptures are enough? Or do we need something else? Peter, in this second epistle, he answered the question for us. But to do that, we saw last week, he mentions the greatest experience. The most real, tangible and extraordinary experience of the transfiguration of Christ, the, the most like extraordinary experience anyone could have. He sets up a point of reference, of comparison, and uh, brings us up to the highest summit of a human experience. So that after that, after showing us that experience, he can say that it is nothing uh, compared to what we have in the Word of God. In, uh, in other words, the biggest um, uh, experience is nothing compared to uh, to the Word of God. However, charismatic and non-charismatic Christians affirm that God somehow communicates with them outside of the Bible. In fact, even among non-charismatic Christians, it is estimated that 80% of them believe that God speaks outside Scripture through subjective impressions, signs, or quote-unquote still small voices, denying in uh, practice the sufficiency of scripture. And yeah, when, when we do that, when we try to find some, some outside the revelation, we are denying in practice the sufficiency of scripture. For example, in his book called uh, How, to How to Listen to God, Charles Stanley writes, I believe one of the most valuable lessons we can ever learn is how to listen to God. His voice waits to be heard. And having heard it, we are launched into the greatest, most exciting adventure we could ever imagine. Southern Baptist pastor Henry Blackaby writes, if anything is clear from a reading of the Bible, this fact is clear. God speaks to his people. He spoke to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis. He spoke to Abraham and the other patriarchs. God spoke to the judges, kings, prophets. God was in Christ Jesus speaking to uh, the disciples. And God spoke to the early church. And God spoke to John on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation. God does speak to his people. And you can anticipate that he will be speaking to you also. With that kind of teaching, Christians expect to somehow hear from God in order to take a decision and be led in a certain direction. They, they expect to, uh, to hear from God and to take a decision, especially like big ones, uh, like uh, whom should I marry or what job I should take, like those kinds of like big decisions. They, they expect to hear from God somehow um, in a non-biblical way. And uh, even if it sounds more spiritual, it is certainly not biblical, as we will see. 
today we, we will continue looking at what Peter writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, affirming that way superior than any subjective experience is the more sure word of the Bible, the word of God. It is um, sufficient and solid and authoritative. It has all author authority and yeah, that's what, what we will see today. But before we start, let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for your word. And today, as we open it together, uh, please, uh, uh, I, we pray that that it's through your spirits that you speak to us. And not, not outside revelations, but through your word. Please, um, please give us discernment and see that, um, please, um, bless bless this uh, preaching of the word and that it um, it is useful for us to discern um, the sufficiency of scripture in Jesus name Amen uh, uh, this message is called the sufficiency of scriptures part 3 the word so we'll read uh, 2nd Peter chapter 1 verses 16 through 21 so Second Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. For we did not make known to you the power and coming of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ, following cleverly devised myths, uh, but being eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have as more sure the prophetic word to which ye do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes by one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by the will of man, but men, being moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Having looked at uh, verses 16 through 18 last week, today we'll focus on uh, verse 19 under three headings, under like three major points. So it's number one, a sure word, secondly, a sure mess, and uh, number three, a sure light. So, number one, a sure word. Some 30 years, approximately after the Transfiguration, Peter refers to that as the most extraordinary experience that no doubt is still fresh in his mind. A marvelous, unbelievable, wonderful, uh, a colossal irreplaceable experience which involved uh, their eyes, ears, uh, touch, reason, and speech, physical and emotional reactions. Yeah, so it's like, well, affected them in, well, yeah, it was really real. They could, they could really experience it, it but, and it was a thousand times beyond any experience we can ever have. However, we have in the Bible something more sure. In verse 19a, uh, he says, And we have as more sure the prophetic word. More sure than the ultimate uh, sure experience of the transfiguration, uh, we have the prophetic word referring to the scriptures the 66 books that we have today and the expression the prophetic word refers to this the old testament and the new testament for example clement of rome for example one of the church fathers of the first century quotes uh, james and second peter and refers to those as scriptures as uh, the prophetic word he calls them the prophetic word so the word of god is uh, the word of God is a prophetic word and when Peter writes that we have the we does not refer only to the apostles but it is generic 
it means we, us here in the church. We all have in our hands something that is far superior than Peter's ultimate experience, and that something is the Bible. It's important to know that the Greek word gives us the correct meaning of this text. It is not that the word is sure because of the experience, but uh, that the word, by its very nature, is more sure than the greatest extraordinary experience. Because by nature, the word of God is, is sure, is more sure. And by the way, if your translation says um, made, made more sure, you must know that made is not in the original. That word is not in the original. Nothing makes the word more sure. It is more sure because that it is its the very nature. And that is uh, what Peter will write in uh, verses 20 through 21. But that's something we'll see next week. The word for more sure is a comparative used in the superlative. The, in, literally, he is writing more reliable or like more abiding or more guaranteed or more sure. That's what I think in Greek the word literally means. The Bible is more sure than any real, valid, genuine human experience. Why? Why do we say the Bible is more sure than, uh, than anything else? Allow me to give you 50 reasons why. The Bible can be understood, the Bible can be studied, and, and it can be parsed, it can be compared, it can be defined, it can be scrutinized, it can be dissected, it can be examined, it can be uh, exegeted, we can exegete it to see the meaning of the text. The Bible is available to everyone that wants to read it. It is an open book to anyone that wants to understand it. It is constantly speaking to anyone that wants to hear it. The Bible is not limited to one, two or three persons' testimony. It is not defined by the experience of a few. It is not based on our five senses. The Bible can be proven by archaeology and science. It can be corroborated by historical records. It can be traced back to very early manuscripts uh, that are very close to the original source. The Bible never changes. It is eternal. Nothing can be added to it to make it complete. Nothing can be subtracted from it to make it more precise. Nothing can be edited to make it more reliable. Nothing can be updated to make it more relevant. The Bible is clear, it means what it says, the Bible is objective, and it says what it means. The Bible is comprehensible, the Bible contains the truth, whether we like it or not. It contains the very words of Almighty God. It was not only supernaturally inspired by God, but also supernaturally preserved also by God Himself. The Bible cannot deceive, the Bible cannot contradict itself. The Bible cannot give bad advice. The Bible cannot lead anyone astray. The scriptures are firmly grounded, constant, certain, coherent, firm, unchangeable, and secure. The culture cannot improve uh, them. Politicians cannot amend them. The mafia cannot silence them. The false religions cannot cloak them. World wars cannot conquer them, viruses cannot infect them, lockdowns cannot contain them, 
Emotions cannot corrupt them, empires cannot tame them, and the devil cannot destroy them. More sure than all experiences, more sure than all the visions, more sure than all the dreams, more sure than all the feelings, more sure than 100 transfigurations, friends, we have a more sure word than anything else, the word of God in front of us. The word of God will make you grow in sanctification. In uh, John 17, uh, verses 17 through 18, Jesus says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. The word of God will keep you from sin. In Psalm 119, uh, verse 9 and verse 11, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. The Word of God will teach you and equip you for a life. In 2 Timothy 3 uh, verses 16 through 17, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. No wonder no wonder a um in uh in the wor in the year 2021 uh, lifeway research published a study that found that among 40,000 people from the ages of 8 to 80 those that engaged with their bibles once or twice a week had none or very negligible changes in their lives Yeah, those who didn't interact with their Bibles a lot. But listen how the Word of God impacted the lives of those that engaged with their Bibles at least four times a week. For those who read it more, feeling lonely drops by 30%, anger issues drop by 32%, bitterness in relationships drops by 40%. Alcohol dependence drops by 57%. Fornication drops by 68%. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops by 60%. Viewing pornography drops by 61%. And, and uh, listen to this. Sharing your faith jumps by 200%. This is the effect of the Word of God. The Word of God will make you grow in the fear of the Lord. In Psalm 119, verse 38, Cause your word to be established for your slave, as that which produces fear for you. The Word of God will tell you all you have to know about yourself, about God, His attributes, His creation, His plans for the future, and about the way of salvation. Only the Bible will tell you that you have broken God's laws, that you are a criminal in God's eyes, that he must punish every guilty sinner in hell for eternity. But the Bible also tells you that he is rich in mercy and, and that he provided the one and only way to be saved. The Bible says uh, that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, lived without sin and then gave his sinless life in exchange for your sinful life so th and so that all who put their faith in him may not perish but have eternal life he was crucified two thousand years ago he paid with his life's blood for the law that you have broken he satisfied he satisfied the god's justice he credits uh, his perfection to your account and died so you don't have to and then three days later he rose from the grave and offers forgiveness of sin and eternal life to every person that repents and believes in him repentance and faith it's what you have to do in response to what god has already done nothing else the bible gives you the assurance romans uh, chapter 10 verse 9 if you confess with your mouth uh, Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Uh, friends, for these countless other reasons, 
we have in front of us a more sure word. A more sure word. Charles Spurgeon said, Peter was with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, and nothing could shake Peter's conviction that he had been there in the midst of the heavenly glory. And yet, for all that, Peter says concerning the inspired word, we have a more sure word of prophecy. He felt that even the memory of that vision, which he had assuredly seen, did not always yield to him so much assurance as did the abidingly inspired word of God. You ought to feel the same. Number two, a sure mess. That's our second major point. A sure mess. Look in verse 19a, and we have as more sure the prophetic word. If this word is more sure than anything else, more if it is more reliable than your own senses, if it is more real than the most tangible experience, including the transfiguration, why would you rely on feelings, on your emotions, and on your circumstances, trying to discern a message from God? Why would you want to do that if we have between our own hands a more sure word? Some Christians want to hear a still small voice following a, mis following a misinterpretation of Elijah's experience in First uh, Kings chapter nine, uh, chapter nineteen. Sorry, maybe an impression, maybe an inaudible voice, maybe an actual whisper, s like something like literally something, anything else besides the Bible. Charles Stanley, a popular Baptist pastor in Atlanta, uh, wrote that he wrote that particular day, I had a very short period of time and so I wanted to buy a turkey for Thanksgiving. My time was running out. I said, God, just show me what to do. It's like God said, go to this store, buy the turkey now. Did God tell me to go? And he says, yes, he did. Friends, this is Gnosticism repackaged. This is the desire of receiving additional privileged divine information. We are uh, doing that by doing that, we are just uh, disguising Gnosticism, seeking an additional um, revelation. Other Christians actually read their Bibles, but they read into the text. And they look for a passage that jumps out of the page. And they look for a subjective, particular, individual message from God that's totally disconnected from the author's intent when writing. Henry Blackaby, an influential pastor and best-selling author, writes about his daughter that was battling cancer. And uh, as he was reading his Bible, he says, a scripture promise came. He says this he he says a scripture promise came this sickness is not unto death Blackaby quotes from uh, John uh, chapter 11 verse 4 when Jesus refers to Lazarus but it has nothing to do with his daughter it is uh, it is not a promise it doesn't talk about cancer but refers to one man's uh, situation Lazarus who, by the way, did die, and Jesus brought him back. Other Christians are looking for signs, a sign from God that can be in the lyrics in a pop song, or in the shape of a cloud, or in the headline in the newspaper, or, well, 
yeah, like a like a pop song, like from some uh, famous artist or something, or a license plate number, or a dog's name, or the shape of a rock, or the foam in their latte, or a floating can of beer. They're seeking a uh, hidden message, like yeah, like some message that they think God might have sent them or something. Priscilla Shirer uh, writes. Persistent internal ideas matched by external confirmation is often the way God directs believers into His will. The problem is that there is no, there are no examples or instructions in Scripture of someone discerning or teaching us. There are no, there are no teachings in in the Bible on how the Bible doesn't tell us like anything on how to like discern like these signs or these like external confirmations in fact the scriptures warns us against trusting in our own understanding in proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 through 6 and uh, following whatever our deceitful heart says in jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 other Christians look for signs to supplement the message of the Bible, like like uh, Gideon that set out a fleece and said, uh, if, if A happens, then I'll take it as you leading me to B. In other words, they say, Lord, if you want me to share the gospel with this person waiting for the bus with me, let him ask me at what time will the next bus be otherwise i'll understand that you don't want me to share the gospel with him uh, gideon's fleece in the old testament is a descriptive passage not a prescriptive passage it is not a model for us to follow and uh, his experience is never copied in scriptures as an example on how uh, his ex his experience is never copied in scripture as an example on how to discern god's will some other christians wait for a strong feeling they focus on their feelings so that if they feel peace if they feel it is all right to do something they do as if god was leading them joyce meyer a popular author and a quote-unquote preacher claims that inner peace is the greatest evidence of God speaking to you outside of the scripture. She says, how do I know that God was talking to me, that my mind wasn't making it up? The answer is that I had peace about what I was receiving. It felt right inside me. However, Scripture never teaches us to count on our feelings of peace, to know what God says. It never teaches us on how to uh, count our feelings of peace, to know what God says, like ever. The Bible never points us to look into our ever-changing emotions. On the contrary, the source of truth is rooted in thus says the Lord, and our peace or lack of peace is irrelevant. If, if God says it, then we can have a sense of peace in our obedience. But other than that, it's irrelevant about how we feel. Think about Moses. Do you think he had peace knowing that he had to deliver his people from Pharaoh? It must have been very unsettling. In fact, Moses gave God five reasons why he wasn't qualified for the task. Yet Moses obeyed. He obeyed because he didn't listen to his inner peace, but he listened to the authoritative and sufficient word of God. Because the word of God is sufficient. Do you think Joshua felt peace knowing they had to conquer the land? God told him to be strong and courageous for a reason, precisely because he wasn't feeling peace. 
Yet he obeyed and followed what God had spoken. Same, same thing with Isaiah and Jeremiah. God told them to preach, but that nobody would listen to him. Ezekiel was commissioned to preach to a rebellious people. The Lord Jesus told Peter that he would be martyred. Um, and, and, and that we are um, preaching the gospel inside and outside the church, knowing that most people will reject the gospel, and etc., etc. This inner peace is totally subjective, but the word of God is outside of us and objective, more sure than any presence or lack of peace. And, um, and still, when you obey what God has already said, you will have peace knowing that you are in His will. In other words, it is not that your peace determines if you are in God's will, but your obedience and submission to the more sure word tells you beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are inside of God's will. And as a consequence, not as a root, but as a consequence, you will have peace through troubling circumstances. And of course, some other uh, Christians read dreams, some others uh, read circumstances, they read what others tell them, they read what Facebook says, they read what their heart says, because obviously for them reading the Bible is not enough. They try to find um, an additional information. Matt Chandler, another popular pastor in uh, Dallas, I think, says that he was led by the Holy Spirit to encourage someone with a vision he had about a pirate ship being chased by sharks. And he, he was supposed to encourage someone with that vision. But if he wanted to encourage someone, why didn't he just pray with that person? Why didn't he just re lead that person through Psalm 32 or John uh, chapter 10? Or Beth Moore, a, a Baptist author and uh, quote-unquote teacher, tells a story of her being in an airport and God telling her clearly and specifically to do not witness to a certain stranger, but to simply go and brush his hair. Why would God say that? Why would, uh, yeah, like, why would he say that? If we look for experiences, we are denying the sufficiency of the scriptures. And what do we have in the end? We have, what are what is the result? We have still small voices, we have passages jumping out of the page, signs putting out a fleece, inner peace, feeling led, following your heart, or the Lord said, uh, the Lord uh, said to me, etc., etc. So the result is an utterly subjective and deceitful sure mess. Friends, there is a better way, because he is rich in mercy, God gave his, us his word. His never-changing, objective, inerrant, authoritative, and sufficient uh, sure word, which, yes, to save us from ourselves and from cleverly devised myths that come from outside the Bible, from <coughs> that 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 come from the book of second imaginations. Jonathan Edwards, the great preacher and theologian during the Great Awakening, wrote, Why cannot we be contented with the divine oracles, that holy, pure word of God, which we have in such abundance and clearness, now since the canon of scripture is completed, why should we desire to have anything added to them by impulses from above? Why should we not rest in that standing rule that God has given to his church, which the apostles teaches us uh, is a surer than a voice from heaven? And why should we desire to make the scripture speak more to us than it does? 
And our third heading today, our third major point is Asher Light. Look at verse 19. I think it's, yeah. And we have as more sure the prophetic word to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the, uh, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. If the word of God is more sure than any experience, then pay attention to it in verse 19b. Uh, that's Peter's admonition here. Don't give your attention to your feelings or emotions or impressions you think come from God. Don't do that. He says, you will do well if you pay attention to the Bible because it is more sure. I give it uh, your undivided attention. Stop being distracted by so many other voices from inside and outside the church. Pay attention to what God has already said, uh, that it is sufficient already. Um, in the fifth message of this series, we'll see that the word is sufficient for uh, the big decisions of life and, uh, and for decisions on, on like daily decisions. Peter tells us to pay attention to the Bible in the same way you would do to a lamp that shines in darkness. There is one singular source of light. You'd stumble and fall without it. You, um, you won't know where you are going. You are left to yourselves and your heart's promptings if you don't listen to what, what the Bible says. That's the recipe for a great fall with eternal consequences. If you turn off the light of the scriptures, you are left in total darkness. The word uh, Peter uses, no wait, sorry. Yeah, the word Peter uses in is unique in the New Testament. It literally means a dry place, uh, a parched place, like a desert. Uh, even like a filthy place and without the sufficient torch of the words to tell you where to go you will follow anything else the light of the scriptures plus traditions the light of the scriptures plus traditions gave us Roman Catholicism the Bible plus visions gave us Mormonism the Bible plus other publications gave us Jehovah's Witnesses the Bible plus additional revelation gave us Islam. The Bible plus modern day prophets gave us a Seventh day Adventists. The Bible plus dreams, feelings, emotions gave us many quote unquote evangelical uh, movements that exegete movies, uh, popular music, and seek experiences. And they deny the sufficiency of scriptures. It is not their priority. Instead of following its single, undivided light, they have added to it. Uh, they are seeking other things, and so they create a rainbow of opinions and confusion. But the Word of God is the only uh, light that we should uh, follow. In the uh, third part of verse 19, it says a more sure word is the light that we ought to follow until the day dawns, is what he says in verse 19c, referring to the second coming. And the morning star rises in our hearts, literally referring to Venus, the, po the polar star that is fixed in heaven. It never changes, and you can look at it and know objectively where is the north. That is the word of God. But also, the Messiah er, er, is referred to as the Star of Jacob in Numbers 24. He's the bright morning star in Revelation 22 and is also the light of the world in John 8. And when he returns, the day will dawn, darkness will end, and the brightest light will be like a birthday candle in, uh, in comparison to the blazing sun that will swallow the darkness of sin in every corner of creation. But until then, 
until that day uh, arrives, we don't need to, to grope around in dark places in ignorance of the truth or seeking God's will where it cannot be found. No, we should not do that. We have the one light that never changes. We have uh, ev anything else will lead us astray. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 26 says, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. The scripture never ever instructs us to take our eyes out of scripture and seek uh, subjective experiences. Yeah, they never tell us to they never tell us to seek subjective experiences and on the contrary the scripture always calls us back to the book encouraging us to hold it up and high so that um, uh, knowing that it is the only uh, light that we have uh, Psalm 119 verse 105 says your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path Jonathan Edwards says they who leave the sure word of prophecy which God has given us as a light shining in a dark place to follow such impressions and impulses leave the guidance of the polar star to follow a jack with a lantern no wonder therefore that sometimes they are led into woeful extravagances and so uh, we are going to be closing the conclusion is the Bible is sufficient, not only because it is far superior than any experience we can have, but also because of its source. Uh, its source comes from God. Its, its source is not a, um, sub a, a, an individual in personal communication. It's not a subjective feeling. It's not like a message we have to decode and discern. It's, it's not like a voice we have to learn to hear. No. The Bible is sufficient because its source is perfect and objective. It's um, because that's what we will see in next time in verse 20 through 21. The Bible resides in God Himself and from Him the very words in this book and forth. It, ca it carries the same perfection and authority and eternality of God. So why follow other things, other experiences? No wonder King David wrote in Psalm 138, verse 2, You have magnified your words according to, or, or together with, in uh, square brackets, uh, all your name. Knowing, believing, and living out the sufficiency of Scripture is the first line of defense against false teachers and ideas that will uh, seek to lead us into rabbit holes and endless empty discussions that will divide the flock and devour those that weren't prepared to stand against lies and that's what will happen uh, to those who don't uh, follow the scripture as their source of authority remember we have a more sure word because its source is more sure than anything else in creation and uh, Peter tells us to uh, listen to it. In the words of the 18th century hymn, how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Let's pray now. Dear Father, thank you for your word, that it that is sufficient and permanent, that is perfect. Thank you that it is inspired by you and that you preserved it uh, for us, and that we don't need to uh, look in any other places to know your uh, your your will. I I pray, please let it be our guide, that that your word may be the light that guides us every day from in the small decisions and in the big ones in our lives please help us to 
to um, yeah, please help us to not follow this uh, this impulse of wanting to seek other sources, but to be uh, satisfied with your word and to be obedient to your word, and that we may find peace and this true relationship with you through your word. Thank you. Thank you for your word, that we can preach it, and that we can hear it. In Jesus' name, amen.